Jujutsu Kaisen has revealed the ultimate truth we were waiting for. A clue on how Sukuna achieved his evolved human status. No way! Kenjaku facing Yuki has not only exposed the strongest curse technique we have ever seen, yes, even stronger than Satoru freaking Gojo, but also a clue to what Jogo meant to Sukuna before, you know, he killed him? Gege Akatami has linked chapter 208 to chapter 116 in an insane twist with Chosso's admission, yearning for his humanity and how his decision will lead to his brother, Yuji Itadori, being left alone with his dark fate. That fate being a lonely path of pain and his certain death. The revelation begins in chapter 208, where Kenjaku and Yuki's insane battle continues. Yuki is heavily injured because Kenjaku cleverly hid a mini Uzumaki attack that none of us saw coming. Unfortunately, Yuki joined the infamous Donut Club, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Out of all the clubs to join, you want to join the donut club? <laughs> I'm kidding. But Yuki wasn't done yet. As Kenjaku was busy talking with Tengen, she sneaked up to him with her ace. Yuki's curse technique allows her to add an imaginary amount of mass to herself or her Shigagami. This is even beyond the comprehension of normal physics. And I have a degree in anime bullshit science fam. Because think about it, there is no limit on how much mass she can add resulting in a crushing force with every attack. But she took that to the next level. If you thought Jogo summoning a freaking meteor in the Shibuya arc was crazy like la dee da. I have news for you. Yuki legit just created a black hole that could suck the entire world and leave no crumbs behind by devouring all matter and even light itself. This is Yuki's ultimate maximum technique and the strongest feat we have ever seen in Jujutsu Kaisen history, surpassing even what Satoru Gojo has showcased thus far. Since mass and density are directly related to each other, Yuki could turn her own body into a black hole, collapsing the infinite mass she produces. But it has, unfortunately, a lot of major consequences. Rather than a maximum attack, this is more of a kamikaze. Yuki's body is immune to the imaginary mass, but only until a certain density, meaning that her body can take up incredulous amount of mass, but since the volume of her body is finite, she has to put a limit on her ability. However, similar to how Megami was also ready to use this suicidal attack against Sukuna and Haruta in chapter 9 and 117, the black hole attack is Yuki's last resort, ensuring that even if she goes down, she will take her opponent with her. Yuki owned Kenjaku's ass cheeks this whole time, we have to admit it. And just as it looked like Kenjaku was gonna lose, my man just Tanked Yuki's black hole simply by being a child. Kenjaku survived a black hole unscathed whilst giving us that, you know, amazing fan service, shirtless. Mwah. Imagine if Satoru Goji did that. That shit will be trending worldwide. So you're probably wondering, is Kenjaku enlightened just like Sukuna and Gojo? Well, the team did succeed in revealing this mastermind's technique, right? Right? <laughs> This chapter just made us realize once again to never trust this lying piece of shit because he was tricking everyone this entire time. Kenjaku's real third curse technique is actually anti-gravity. Oh, come on. On top of that, that's only one of them. <laughs> 
Yes. What's even more shocking is that Kenjaku actually stole this technique from none other than Yuji Itadori's mother, Itadori Kaori. People with the notification bell on already know this information from the video we posted last week. That in chapter 143, we see that Kenjaku had actually taken over the body of a mysterious woman and had even given birth to Yuji to create the perfect vessel for Sukuna. Itadori Kaori's body being engraved with the anti-gravity makes us wonder if she was actually from one of the big three Jujutsu clans. It would make a lot of sense if Kenjaku had eyes on her for a long time as a vessel with the technique, as it would have helped him against Satoru Gojo as well. However, with Yuki's logic, Kenjaku shouldn't have any more cursed techniques without frying his brain. So where is Kenjaku storing this extra cursed technique if he doesn't have an external storage like Yuta has Rika? And how did he even extract it from his Vessels. Is there a limit? Or does Kenjaku have more curse techniques from all the other hosts he lived in? Well, Kenjaku's curse technique is an endless mystery. Tengen speculates that Kenjaku's attack tanking Yuki's black hole was curse technique reversal, resulting in anti-gravity. However, we come to know that Kenjaku had been actually using reversal this entire fight, turning anti-gravity into a gravity technique. Now, if you're still confused and you're wondering what's even going on, don't worry, I got your back. We're ABD after all, right? I'll answer these questions, but smash the like button to show your support. So back in chapter 14, Gojo demonstrated, or should I say, flexed his limitless curse technique against Jogo using the red version of it. Red limitless is actually the opposite of Gojo's blue technique because whilst one repels whatever is around it, the other attracts it. Blue is the neutral form of limitless but by using reverse curse energy instead of regular curse energy for the technique, Gojo can create red. And in the same way, Kenjaku pumped reverse curse energy into his anti-gravity to use gravity. This not only shows how much of a genius Kenjaku is, but also how busted he is. Cause he is the only sorcerer that we have seen other than Satoru Gojo to use curse technique reversal. Gege Akatami brought back this concept from chapter 74 to strengthen Kenjaku's place as one of the strongest characters of the series rather than simply telling us so. But sadly, whilst Kenjaku survived, our girl, <laughs> man, Yuki, y Yuki's gone. She's gone. She's dead. <laughs> Yuki meets the fate of every sorcerer, but was selfless. She's fulfilled the idealistic dream Satoru Gojo would like to create by reforming society. Gojo, amongst others, believes being a little crazy is a requirement to being a sorcerer, as they detach themselves from normal society and genuine compassion. This makes it difficult for some Jujutsu sorcerers to feel compassion in any curse-related situation. However, However, Yuki sacrificed rebirthed Choso to live on as a human and die as a curse in this moment. Kenjaku had the perfect counter to Yuki's attack with anti-gravity, pushing away any pulling force created by the black hole. The whole world did not explode and 8 billion people didn't die because Yuki activated this ability within Tengen's barrier. But what's interesting is that the Culling Games has one one final bombshell to drop as Kenjaku was about to reveal it in chapter 206. Master Tengen seemed way too calm for someone panicking at the very thought of Kenjaku finding her in chapter 145. In fact, their reunion leads to quite the peculiar exchange where Kenjaku finds the appearance Tengen chose for herself amusing. Laughing at her face. That one there was a violation. This is where Kenjaku notices what we have been saying Bar for bar, word for word. 
Kenjaku states that Tengen appears eerily similar to Sukuna's true form. Sukuna is the epitome of evolution in the series, and his evolution is most definitely related to Tengen. He managed to go from a fierce human sorcerer to an indestructible special grade curse object with the power to reincarnate 1000 years into the future. Kenjaku implying that Tengen looks similar to Sukuna tells us that Sukuna forced himself to evolve. Remember guys, since Tengen's merger with Riko Amanai failed, she was forced by her curse technique to evolve as Principal Yaga mentioned. Moreover, Tengen even mentioned in chapter 145 that living for 500 years without the merger severely impacted her aging and even turned her into more of a cursed spirit than a human. Except Sukuna. This is the only case we know so far where a human sorcerer turned into a cursed spirit or anything close to it via a means other than death without cursed energy like Nooya did. And with the kind of knowledge about cursed energy and Jujutsu Sukuna possesses, it would be no surprise if he found a way to evolve himself. He could have even been inspired to become a Tengen-like being after knowing about her worst case scenario evolution. Clearly, evolution isn't the most pleasant experience in the Jujutsu world, which would also explain Sukuna's abnormal forearms as well as multiple eyes and mouths. This links back to Jujutsu Kaisen's theme of enlightenment. In Buddhism, there's a lot of suffering a person has to endure if they wish to achieve enlightenment. Just like the Jujutsu world, the pain is a cost they have to bear to become an honored being who understands curse energy on an intricate level. From the latest developments, we can say that humanity and human appearance is the price for evolution and enlightenment in Jujutsu. Choso lamenting about his choice in chapter 208 is further proof of this. It's great to see the inner conflict he's facing between being a human and a cursed spirit just like Yuji Itadori, paralleling him to the point that he knows the weight of the life he took in Shibuya. Just like Yuji, he feels he's undeserving of living and almost sacrificed himself had Tengen not interfered. His views are the complete opposite to that of Sukuna. The King of Curses is extremely selfish and believes he alone is the supreme being. All he cares about is how he can use the tools around him in the best way possible. Sukuna is the embodiment of what one can call individualism and he looks down upon upon everyone else, including the cursed spirits like Jogo. He even thinks that humans are disposable and never thinks twice before sacrificing them. This is again in contrast to how Satro Gojo symbolizes collectivism and wants to achieve a greater good and mentors his students in the same manner. He knows that selfishness and mindless discrimination against anyone has major consequences, like the incident with his best friend Suguru Ghetto. Itadori is carrying the heavy burden of trying to figure himself out. He has genuinely accepted that he must pay for the crime Sukuna has committed in his body, and he's just a cog in the machine. Even worse, Sukuna revels in the fact that he can force Yuji to face his worst nightmares. He even has the binding vow at his disposal to use at any point in time, which he will definitely use to regain his true enlightened form. Thus, Yuji really needs someone like Choso by his side the most right now because they're the only family that the both of them have left. Choso is truly the best, I'm gonna say, Onichan, as he truly cares about Yuji and can understand the weight his brother is carrying. In a poetic way, helping Yuji is the way for him to be freed from his curse and reborn as a human this time, which hey, Sukuna would find um, laughable. <laughs> In chapter 116, when Sukuna faced Jogo, we see what he meant through Choso's words in chapter 208. I didn't want to see them in pain from living as humans. Humans would never accept my brothers. Looking back holistically, we can see Jogo before his death stating he's sorry to his brothers in arms. Other curses that died just like him. They were jealous of the humans and the infinite potential they possessed. Sukuna asked if they wanted to become 
become humans. But calls that foolish because humans or curses flocking together, comparing themselves to others around them, causes weakness and stunts their growth. Sukuna claims that the curses lack hunger to take hold of their desires to reach the enlightened level of Satoru Gojo. Therefore, this is yet another clue that Sukuna's individualism forced his evolution just like Tengen. There's definitely a deep running relationship between Sukuna, Tengen and Kenjaku that occurred 1000 years ago. As the chapter states, she was once friends with Kenjaku too. It seems that Tengen's plan all along was actually to play the bare minimum role and sacrifice Yuki to have the best shot at taking Kenjaku down. And since Yuki's black hole literally destroyed Tengen's barrier and everything inside it, Tengen herself crumbled because her physical form was being held only with the barriers. She became one with the tree, effectively falling into Kenjaku's hands. Now that Kenjaku has acquired Tengen, he will go ahead with his plan of merging non-sorcerers with her. The best time for him to do this is when sorcerers like Yuji and his team are compromised with the new foreign threats that he involved by talking to the world leaders about infinite energy from chapter to 200. Therefore, they can't interfere in his plan. They will have to fend for their lives soon enough. And talking about survival, well, Gojo is acing this shit being holed up in the prison realm and all. After coming to know about Kenjaku's real motives and related actions, there's a chance that he actually wants Gojo to be unsealed after the evolution or merging is done. Back in chapter 91, Kenjaku nonchalantly told him that they'd me again in the new world. Kenjaku knew that Gojo would get out of the prison realm one way or another. He only wanted to seal Gojo long enough to stall any discrepancies in his plan of the merger. And in an ironic way, Gojo actually fits the idea of Kenjaku's new world where anyone with cursed energy is an asset. And well, we already know that he is advertising Gojo as an indispensable pawn with unlimited energy to the world leaders that want to make money and retain their corrupt powers. Gojo is such an anomaly and an extraordinary sorcerer, one in eight million type person, that he understands cursed energy in an immense depth thanks to his six eyes as well. Gojo is a rare species who will be the target of all countries who want to get their hands on him. So even when Gojo does come out of the prison realm, he will have a tough time. Yuda has swore to kill Kenjaku, but he will have to be very 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 cautious approaching him. However, there is no doubt that their showdown will be a sight to behold as they both have multiple curse techniques and are extremely OP. If you want to understand how overpowered Yuta is with Rika, make sure to watch the video displayed on your screen right now to enjoy more peak fiction.